In this presentation, we are going to take a look at the book of Helaman, chapters 13 through 16. So let's take a look at some of the doctrinal principles that this chapter teaches us and things that can help us prepare for Christ's second coming. First of all, we'll just take a look at Helaman 13 through 16 as a whole. Third, Helaman 13 through 16, the following chart is a continuation of what we've been doing the last few presentations of what President Benson said about the books in the Book of Mormon just prior to the Savior's visit to the Nephites being parallel to the Savior's second coming. That would be Helaman through 3 Nephi 9. He said, the record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. So let's take a look at some of those parallels. Events that happened in the Nephite time that will happen again prior to Christ's second coming. Number one, Helaman 13. The event or sign is people's hearts or set upon riches, followed by the loss of riches. We'll see that again in Revelation 17 and 18. Number two, Helaman 14 and 3 Nephi 1. A day, a night, and a day with no darkness. So the famous sign of a day, a night, and a day as if one long day. That seems to be repeated in Zechariah 14, 6 through 7 seems to clearly indicate that that sign will once again repeat itself. Chapter number three, Helaman 14, signs and wonders in heaven. There'll be signs and wonders in heaven. That's said in Doctrine and Covenants 45 and Joel 2. And then President Joseph Fielding Smith said the following, one wonders if we are not now seeing some of the signs in heaven, not all, for undoubtedly some of them will be among the heavenly bodies such as the moon and the sun and the meteors and the comets. But in speaking of the heavens, reference is made to that part which surrounds the earth and which belongs to it. It is in the atmosphere where many of the signs are to be given. Do we not see airships of various kinds traveling through the heavens daily? Have we not had signs in the earth and through the earth with the radio, railroad trains, automobiles, submarines, and satellites, and in many other ways? There are yet to be great signs. The heavens are to be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man is to be given. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn. End of quote of President Joseph Fielding Smith. Number four in Helaman 14 and 3 Nephi 10. A vent or sign is the prophet's testimony of the second coming. Acts 3 and D.C. 133. Again, prophets will testify of his coming. Number five, Helaman 14 through Nephi 8. There will be earthquakes, storms. There was earthquakes, storms, tempests, thunders, and lightnings. And then again, Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, of DNC 43 and 88 says, There again will be earthquakes, storms, tempests, thunderings, and lightnings. Number six, Helaman 14 and third Nephi 8. There will be a period of darkness covers the earth. Moses 7, 61 seems to indicate that that parallel will happen again before Christ's coming. And then number seven, our last one, Helaman 16, 3 Nephi 1. A period of darkness, I'm sorry, the wicked, the wicked's denial of signs, wonders, and the Savior's second coming. And so the wicked will just, oh, these aren't signs, these are just natural occurrences and they're not signs of his coming. That's what they claimed back then. Second Peter 3 and DNC 45. That should be DNC 45. That once again will take place. Okay, so there are some of those events and signs that did happen in the Nephite times and will happen again prior to Christ's second coming.
Here are some now teachings in 13 through 16 that will help prepare us for the Savior's second coming that we get out of Helaman 13 through 16. Number one, Helaman 13 verses 2 through 38. With Samuel the Lamanite, the Book of Mormon story takes a particular twist so far as righteousness and wickedness are concerned. With the Nephites and Lamanites had exchanged places. The Nephites were puffed up with pride, were full of vain boastings, envy, and strife, and malice. They would persecute any who dared challenge their behavior and involve themselves in all manner of iniquity, not stopping short of murder. Indeed, they cast out, stoned, and killed the servants of God who were sent among them. At the same time, they reverenced false teachers and prophets who flattered them in their vileness. In contrast, most of the Lamanites walked circumspectly before God, faithfully honoring their covenants. As the preceding verses note, the Lamanites were strict to observe the law of Moses. The wickedness and iniquities of Nephites would cause the Spirit of the Lord to withdraw from them. With the loss of that Spirit would come the loss of His Word. For that Word can only be understood by the Spirit which they had so grievously offended. Because the Nephites had become worshippers of worldly things and had made gold, silver, and other precious things the God to whom they bowed and to whom they rendered their praise and their offerings of homage, the true and living God threatened that a curse would come upon the land, causing their riches to vanish and their buried treasures to disappear, never to be found again. On the other hand, the righteous, those who choose to serve the God of heaven, could safely hide up their treasures that they had been consecrated for the benefit of his kingdom. They would be protected and could be brought forth when necessary. So we must not cast out the prophets among us, brothers and sisters. We must hold tightly to the word of God, whether in the scriptures or through God's prophets. The Nephites had cast out the true prophets of the Lord to only accept false prophets that teaching pleasing things to the carnal man. False prophets say what the people want to hear. Their counsel is colored by their con constituency. Their warnings watered down by the demands of the audience. Paul warned of a day when wicked people would not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap up to themselves the kind of teachers and preachers and prophets who tickle the ears, false witnesses who crave acceptance and popularity more than righteousness. Thus, repentance, humility, and the rejection of the worship of worldly things will prepare us for the Savior's coming. Number 2, Helaman 14, verses 3 through 9. Samuel the Lamanite proceeded to provide the Nephite that there will be many signs and wonders of Christ's coming. Those who are paying attention, are prayerful and watchful, will be amazed and fall to the earth, hopefully causing them to repent and come unto the Savior and believe on his name. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, Belief brings salvation and belief brings damnation. Men are saved or damned depending on what they believe. We will always, brothers and sisters, believe in something. Back to Elder McConkie. If they believe in Christ and his saving truths, they are heirs of salvation. If they believe in a false system of salvation, they will be damned. It is one thing to worship the living Lord and quite another to worship dead deities that have been graven by art and man's devices. End of quote. It is one thing to accept Christ as our Savior and quite another to accept him as our Lord and Master. The former is to profess the acceptance of the blessings of salvation. The latter to assume the burdens of discipleship, of submitting ourselves to his guidance and lordship. In the present text, salvation is inextricably woven into the acceptance of the doctrine of Christ's divine sonship. Number three, Helaman 14, 40, 10 through 13, 17 through 19, and 29 through 31, we learn. If we truly believe on the name of Christ, then we will repent, thereby gaining a remission of our sins through his merits. The thoughtful student of Scripture must be aware that it is one thing to believe in Christ and quite another to believe on his name. To believe in the name of Christ is here announced as embracing repentance from all our sins. Whereas one may profess to believe in Christ and yet not have abandoned sin. 
There are certain prerequisites to believing on the name of Christ. First, the acceptance of Christ and the willingness to be a witness of him at all times, in all things, and in all places. Second, the acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This precludes the right to pick and choose, to sort out the doctrine that could bring inconvenience and social embarrassment. Third, the acceptance of those who have been commissioned to represent the Lord, that is, to sustain and uphold his anointed servants. And fourth, to sustain and be loyal to that church upon which he has placed his name and within which is found the authority to perform the ordinances of salvation. Thus, those who use their agency to repent will not be cut off from God and suffer the second death, which second death is to be cut off as things pertaining to righteousness. All accountable souls are responsible for their own actions. Ultimately, everyone will stand exalted or condemned by their own choices. We may harm others with evil, but none more than ourselves. We Again, we can bless others through our righteousness, but none more than ourselves. We are our choices, and thus, in the words of Alma, we are our own judges. This freedom is not something inherent in man. It comes through the atonement. Lehi taught, the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may be redeemed at the children of men from the fall and because they are redeemed from the fall they have become free forever knowing good from evil to act for themselves and not to be acted upon number four helaman 15 4 through 10 as many of the lamanites that were converted were firm and steadfast in the faith to be firm and steadfast is to be constant consistent and vigilant in one's faith and approach to living the gospel their firmness and steadfastness caused them that they do walk circumspectly before God, and they do observe to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, thus leading them to believe in the holy scriptures, the prophecies of the holy prophets, which leadeth them to have faith on the Lord and to repentance, bringing a mighty change of heart. See verse 7. Thus leading them to bury their weapons of war, suffering themselves to be trodden down and slain because of their faith in Christ. Verse 9. We too then must become firm and steadfast in living the gospel, walking circumspectly before God, willing to submit to his will in all things, even to the burying of our weapons of war, fear, false traditions, unforgiving heart, envy, vengeance, etc., those are some of our weapons of war, and become truly converted. Number five, Helaman 16, 15 through 23. Though there were many signs given, the more part of the people did harden their hearts, depending on their own strength and wisdom. They surmised that the prophets had just guessed right about many things, but that all the things the prophet that prophesied about could not come to pass that it was not reasonable that a being as Christ should come, and that it was just a wicked tradition handed down by the fathers to keep the people in ignorance, so that they will be servants to the words of the prophets. Thus Satan kept the people in bondage because of the vain imagination of their hearts. No, to be prepared, we must truly believe in the prophecies of the prophets and follow their words with exactness. If we are to be prepared for Christ's coming, then we must submit our will to the will of the Father in all things, as taught by his servants, the prophets, and as we are taught by the Holy Ghost in our personal lives. Let's now go to Helaman chapter 13. Take a look at some of the principles that are found here. 13 verse 3, the phrase, whatsoever things should come into his heart. Samuel, who was a prophet, did not take it upon himself to decide what to preach to the Nephites. We read in Helaman 13.3 that he taught whatsoever things should come into his heart. Concerning this revelatory process, President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described how the voice of the Lord often comes. Revelation comes as words we feel more than hear. Nephi told his wayward brothers, who were visited by an angel, you were past feeling that you could not feel his words. And this is not just mere emotions. Feeling the Spirit is different than emotions. 
It is something you can't explain. You have to just witness it for yourself. But when you feel the Spirit, you will know that it is Him talking. It's not just feeling good or feeling some emotion, but feeling the pure peace of Christ. The scriptures are full of such expressions as the veil was taken from our minds and the eyes of our understanding were opened, or I will tell you in your mind and in your heart, or I did enlighten thy mind, or speak the thoughts that I will put into your heart. There are hundreds of verses which teach of revelation, end of quote. So there are many different ways he just gave right there. Was that four different ways in which revelation can come? Chapter 13, verses 12 through 16. The phrase spared because a few of a few righteous people. There have been times when the wicked were spared from terrible destruction because there were righteous people living among them. The wicked people of Zarahemla had the righteous people to thank for their preservation from destruction, though of course they did not know it. In a few years, Zarahemla lost this silent and unappreciated protection, and Samuel's words were fulfilled. Even Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared if only ten righteous people had lived there, but they could not find even ten righteous in that city. How we live really does make a difference. The personal righteousness of a few can become a great blessing to others, especially to those in our own family and local community. Chapter 13, verses 19 through 22, Riches and Spirituality. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described the relationship between materialism and spirituality. Materialism, which gives priority to material needs and objects, is obviously the opposite of spirituality. The Savior taught that we should not lay up treasures upon earth where moth and dust, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. We should lay up treasures in heaven, for your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There is nothing inherently evil about money. The Good Samaritan used the same coinage to serve his fellow man that Judas used to betray the master. It is the love of money which is the root of all evil, we find in 1 Timothy. The critical difference is the degree of spirituality we exercise in viewing, evaluating, and managing the things of this world and our experiences in it. If allowed to become an object of worship or priority, money can make us selfish and prideful, puffed up in the vain things of the world. In contrast, if used for fulfilling our legal obligations, for paying our tithes and offerings, money can demonstrate integrity and develop unselfishness. The spiritually enlightened use of property can help us prepare us for the higher law of a celestial glory, even the full and complete law of consecration. Chapter 13, verses 24 through 39, Following the Living Prophet. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught the importance of following living prophets and apostles. Quote, now, my dear brothers and sisters, please pay attention to those things that the leaders of the church have taught. Apply the teachings that will help you and your family. Let all of us, regardless of our family circumstances, bring into our homes the teachings of the prophets and the apostles to strengthen our relationship with each other, with our Father in heaven, and with the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise you in the name of the Lord that if you will listen, not just with your ears, but also with your heart, the Holy Ghost will manifest the truth unto you of the message delivered by the president of the church, his counselors, the apostles, and other leaders of the church. The Spirit will prompt you to know what you should do as individuals and as families in order to follow our counsel, that your testimonies might be strengthened, and that you might have peace and joy. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 29, the phrase, led by foolish and blind guides. Each person is responsible for his or her own spiritual welfare. 
Though the Lord expects us to be loving and caring to others, and especially to encourage those who are weak in the faith, no one of us can be blessed or blamed on the basis on the basis of someone else's faithfulness or waywardness. Nor will he who is the embodiment of truth and justice and judgment be patient everlastingly with those who trust their lives to blind guides, to those who wander in the morass of judgment. Be patient everlasting with those who trust in their lives to blind, I'm sorry, to those who wander the morass of uncertainty, who proceed with great confidence down the wide road to destruction, all in the name of discipleship. Chapter 13, verse 38. Iniquity is contrary to the nature of happiness. Samuel warned the Nephites that they had been seeking happiness in doing iniquity, which is contrary to the nature of happiness. Speaking of this problem and how happiness comes, Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles pointed out that happiness only comes with righteousness. Quote, Have you ever noticed how Satan works to capture the mind and emotions with flashing images, blaring music, and the stimulation of every physical sense to excess? He diligently strives to fill life with action, entertainment, and stimulation so that one cannot ponder the consequences of his tempting invitations. Think of it. Some are tempted to violate the most basic commandments of God because of seductive actions portrayed as acceptable. They are made to seem attractive, even desirable. There seems to be no serious consequences, but rather apparent lasting joy and happiness. But recognize that those performances are controlled by scripts and actors. The outcomes of decisions made is likewise manipulated to be whatever the producer wants. Life is not that way. Yes, moral agency allows you to choose what you will, but you cannot control the outcome of those choices. Unlike the false creations of man, our Father in Heaven determines the consequences of your choices. Obedience will yield happiness, while violation of His commandments will not. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 38, the phrase, Your days of probation are past. This life is a probationary state, a time of testing, trying, and proving. Those who keep this, their second estate, shall have glory added upon their heads forever and ever. Those who use their moral probation unwisely, having had what God judges to be a complete and fair chance to accept the gospel and the covenants of salvation, will not have the chance restored to them in the spirit world. Though they may accept the gospel there, to their everlasting benefit, they will have forfeited the chance for exaltation. Assuming they led honorable lives and mortality, their promise is that of a terrestrial glory. Joseph Smith declared the doctrine poetically as follows, quote, There are they that are honorable men of the earth, who were blinded and duped by the cunning of men. They received not the truth of the Savior at first, but did when they heard it in prison again. Not valiant for truth, they obtained not the crown, but are of that glory that tipped by the moon. They are, they are they that come into the presence of Christ, but not to the fullness of God on his throne. End of quote. Helaman, chapter 13, verse 38. The phrase procrastinated the day of your salvation until it is everlastingly too late. All tests must end. Mortality must end. The day of probation must end. There is that point at which every chance has been given, and when the day of darkness has come, that day in which no labor can be performed. For those who have failed to repent before that dreadful day, it may be said that they have procrastinated the day of their salvation until it is everlastingly too late, and their destruction is made sure. Brothers and sisters, it is after the resurrection that there will be no labor performed. That's why we do the work while there is a spirits in spirit prison. Once a person is resurrected, no more ordinances are performed for you. That is why there cannot be progression between kingdoms. Can someone in a telestial kingdom cannot be baptized after their resurrection, and baptism is the gate into the celestial kingdom. 
So may we take advantage of our probationary state here on earth and perform all the ordinances for ourselves that is necessary to return to him before the resurrection. Let's now go to Helaman chapter 14. 14 verse 5, the phrase, there shall a new star arise. Note that the prophecy says a new star will rise, not a bright star that no one could miss. Most depictions of this star is a bright star with its tail pointing down to where Christ lay. If this was so, then how did many miss the sign when it was so bright and obvious? I suggest that the verse means exactly what it states, that a new star one that was not there the night before was now in the sky. Can you imagine how observant and meticulously you would have to be to be able to discern that a new star was now among all the other millions? These wise men were truly watching diligently for the sign of the new star. Are we being just as meticulous and paying just as much attention to our signs? Again, a new star came out. wasn't there the night before. It doesn't say a bright star that everybody could see that it was brand new. No, it doesn't say that. A bright star with a tail pointing down. It was just a new star. You would have to be paying attention in the skies every night. Chapter 14, verse 11, the phrase that you might know the conditions of repentance. Elder Richard G. Scott taught about the conditions of repentance. In The Miracle of Forgiveness, Spencer W. Kimball, this is quoting Elder Scott, gave a superb guide to forgiveness through repentance. It has helped many find their way back. He identifies five elements, essential elements of repentance. Sorrow for sin. Study and ponder determine how serious the Lord defines your transgression to be. That will bring healing, sorrow, and remorse. It will also bring a sincere desire for change and a willingness to submit to every requirement for forgiveness. Abandonment of sin. This is an unyielding, permanent resolve to not repeat the transgression by keeping this commitment. The bitter aftertaste of that sin need not be experienced again. Confession of sin. You always need to confess your sins to the Lord. If they are serious transgressions, such as immorality, they need to be confessed to a bishop, bishop or stake president. Please understand that confession is not repentance. It is an essential step, but it is not itself adequate. Partial confession by men mentioning lesser mistakes will not help you resolve a more serious undisclosed transgression. Restitution for sin. You must restore as far as possible all that which is stolen, damaged, or defiled. Willing restitution is concrete evidence to the Lord that you are committed to do all you can to repent. Obedience to all the commandments. Full obedience brings the complete power of the gospel into your life with strength to focus on the abandonment of specific sins. It includes things you might not initially consider part of repentance, such as attending meetings, paying tithing, giving service, and forgiving others. I would add a sixth step, recognition of the Savior. Of all the necessary steps to repentance, I testify that the most critical and important is for you to have a conviction that forgiveness comes because of the Redeemer. It is essential to know that only on His terms can you be forgiven. End of Elder Scott's quote. In addition to the important elements taught above by President Spence W. Crimble and Elder Scott, repentance also includes must must also include change. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, We must change anything we can change and may be part of the, we can change that may be part of the problem. We thank our Father in heaven we are allowed to change. We thank Jesus we can change and ultimately we do so only with their divine assistance. Certainly not everything we struggle with is a result of our actions. Often it is a result of the actions of others or just the mortal events of life. But anything we can change, we should change, and we must forgive the rest. In this way, our access to the Savior's atonement becomes, an becomes as unimpeded as we, with our imperfections, can make it. He will take it from there. End of quote. 
chapter 14, verses 15 through 19, the phrase, the atonement overcomes death. Our Lord's death was absolutely necessary. There was no other way. It was essential that he suffer, bleed, and die. We are not saved because Jesus was a great speaker. We are not saved because his words are like manna to the starving soul. We are not saved because of his goodness and kindness, even his perfection. All of these things stand as guides, as illustrations of the kinds of things we ought to do and be. Jesus was our exemplar. As Paul said, however, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Our hope in Christ indeed stretches beyond this veil of tears, not alone because of its immaculate life, immaculate life, but also because of the regeneration and redemption which comes to us as a result of his death. Samuel the Lamanite described the difference between physical death, the first spiritual death, and the second spiritual death, as well as how the Savior atonement helps us overcome these deaths. Physical death, Elder Earl C. Tingey of the Presidency of the Seventy defined physical death and who will experience it. Physical death is a separation of the spirit from the physical body. Because of the fall of Adam, all mankind will suffer physical death. The first spiritual death. Spiritual death is when someone is cut off from the presence of the Lord. President Spencer W. Kimball explained that both of these deaths are the result of the fall of Adam and Eve. Quote, our first parents, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God. By eating the forbidden fruit, they became mortal. Consequently, they and all of their descendants became subject to both mortal and spiritual death. Mortal death, the separation of the body, and spiritual, the spiritual death, the separation of the spirit from the presence of God, and death as pertaining to the things of the spirit. End of quote. For us, this spiritual death occurs when we left God's presence and were born into mortality. Samuel the Lamanite called being cut off from his presence the first death. Samuel the Lamanite taught that all of Heavenly Father's children who lived in mortality will overcome physical and spiritual death through the powers of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Many other scriptures also attest to this fact, and you can look up those that are on the screen if you'd like to. The second spiritual death. The second death is an ultimate or final spiritual death that comes not because of leaving God's presence to be born in mortality, but becomes because of unrepentant personal sin. The Savior also has also provided help to overcome this second spiritual death. By suffering for our sins, he offers us the opportunity to repent. But to those who do not repent, then cometh upon them again a spiritual death, yea, a second death, for they are cut off again as to things pertaining to righteousness. This means that a person with unresolved sin cannot remain in God's presence after he or she is brought back to him for judgment. So, brothers and sisters, in short, or in other words, in order to get back to the presence of God, you have to do absolutely nothing. Christ's atonement brings us back into Heavenly Father's presence to be judged of Him. Now, if you want to stay with Him in His presence and live with Him and then become like Him, then you must obey His commandments and follow His Son and use His atonement for repentance. But His atonement gets us all back. It just depends on whether you want to stay or live there. That will depend upon our actions, our obedience, our coming unto Christ, and having his grace save us. Those who do not repent and do not use his atonement then will be kicked out of his presence and again cut off from his presence and be spiritually dead. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described this condition. If physical death should strike before moral wrongs have been right, right, opportunity for repentance will have been forfeited. Thus, the real sting of death is sin. Even the Savior cannot save us in our sins. He will redeem us from our sins, but only upon condition of repentance. We are responsible for our own spiritual survival or death. End of quote. Let's now turn to Helaman chapter 15. 15 verses 1 through 4. 
the love versus hate, an analysis of Helaman 15, 1 through 4. It talks about there are people that the Lord loves and those he hates. What does he mean by that? Few literary genres from the ancient world stand out so prominently as the Near Eastern Vassal Treaty. Scholars have shown that those these political contracts formed between vassal kings and Caesarean provided the conceptual background for the book of Deuteronomy. The assumption is that Israel conceived of its relationship to Yahweh as that of subject peoples to a worldly king, and that they express this relationship in the concepts and formulas of the Caesarean Treaty. In the Near Eastern Treaty, vassals were required to love their superiors. If you do not love the crown prince, designate Ashur Banipal, warns the Syrian Treaty of Ashur Hadon. Then may Ashur, king of the gods, who determines the fate, decree for you an evil, unproportionate, perpetuous fate. In this ancient context, loving the king with one's entire heart signifies the severance of all contact with other political powers. Hence, Israel's commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might, presented in the book of Deuteronomy, seems to refer to a political and or spiritual commitment rather than an emotional attachment. Scholars in recent decades have shown that in the biblical world, the word love often represented a covenantal devotion to one's superior, while its opposite, namely hate, at times signified the status of an individual outside of this affiliation. While the connotation of these words for Westerners usually signifies an intense emotional charge, in the ancient Near East, love and hate often carried the aforementioned unique covenantal connotation. All there, the Ephraimites' wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house, Hosea 9.15 said. As demonstrated in this biblical passage, the Ephraimites' wickedness resulted in their loss of the blessings associated with having the God of Israel serve as their sovereign. The Lord hated the Ephraimites for the wickedness of their doings, because in the context of ancient Near Eastern treaties, these acts were tantamount to a political insurrection. As a result, the Ephraimites were removed from God's covenantal house or family. I will love them no more, declared the Lord. All their princes are revolters. Thus the words love and hate in the biblical world often carried a deliberate connotation of political allegiance or lack thereof. So when it says that they love the Lord, it means that they kept their covenants. When it says hate... That means they are living outside the covenant. They have broken their covenants. When the Lord says, I hate the Ephraimites, it's because of their wickedness and they had broken their covenants. He hates that they have broken their covenant with him. With this observation in mind, the problematic passage in Helaman 15, where Simon the Lamanite describes God's love and hate, seems to convey a specific nuance derived from the world of antiquity. When Samuel presents his inspired message to the people of Nephi, he declares, They, the Nephites, had been a chosen people of the Lord, yea, the people of Nephi hath he loved. Verse 3. With these words, Samuel attempts to remind the Nephites that they have traditionally served as God's covenant people. In this relationship, the Lord has acted as the Nephite Caesarean from which the people of Nephi have received reciprocal love. In contrast, Samuel presents his own people, Lamanites, as those whom God hath hated because their deeds have been evil continually. Verse 4. Sig Significantly, Samuel uses the verb hate in the same context in which it appeared in the book of Hosea. God hated the Lamanites in parallel manner the way he hated the Ephraimites, meaning their evil acts had placed them outside the boundary of his covenant relationship. And he hates that. He wants us to be inside the boundaries of the covenant relationship so that he can save us. 
While some modern readers have expressed concern regarding this apparently harsh statement preserved in the Book of Mormon, Samuel's message relates perfectly to the context of love and hate in the ancient sense of alliances. Am I aligned with Christ? He loves me to be covenant with him, to have allegiance to him. He hates it when, because of wickedness, I sever that alliance with him. That's what he means by love and hate. It has to do with the covenant in your relationship to Christ in that covenant. Let's go to Helaman chapter 16. Helaman 16 verses 2 through 3 and 6 through 8, divine protection. The protection Samuel received while he delivered his message of repentance is not unusual. The scriptures include several examples of prophets who were threatened but whose lives were miraculously guarded so they could complete their mission. Consider the following examples and recall how they were able to present the Lord's words, words while under the threat of injury or death. Noah, Abraham, Lehi, Nephi, and Abinadi. Sometimes the Lord's servants eventually lose their lives, but not until, as Abinadi declared, they have delivered the message which the Lord sent them to deliver. Elder Robert D. Hills, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, reminds us, quote, Prophets of all dispensations have willingly put their lives on the line and with courage have done the will and proclaimed the word of God. Let us follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and his prophets, past and present. It may not be required of us to give our lives as martyrs, as did many of the prophets. What is required is our obedience to the Lord's commandments and our faithfulness to the covenants we have made with him. End of quote. The phrase is often said, I would be willing to die for the Lord. Maybe a better phrase is, brothers and sisters, are you and I willing to live righteously for the Lord? Chapter 16, verses 2 through 20, reactions to the prophet. Helaman 16 records the way the wicked reacted to the prophet Samuel and his message. President Ezra Tappan spoke of how the wicked react to, react to prophets of our day. Quote, the prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or the worldly. As a prophet reveals the truth, it divides the people. The honest in heart heed his words, but the unrighteous either ignore the prophet or fight him. When the prophet points out the sins of the world, the worldly either want to close the mouth of the prophet or else act as if the prophet didn't exist, rather than repent of their sins. Popularity is never a test of truth. Many a prophet has been killed or cast out. As we come close to the Lord's second coming, you can expect that as the people of the world become more wicked, the prophet will be less popular with them. End of quote. Boy, are we seeing that coming to pass. The following list includes some reasons why the people in Helaman 16, 2 through 21, refused to hear the words of the prophets. One, subsequent scattering of the Jews, verses 17 through 20. Two, personal anger they had towards the prophets, verse 2. Number three, prophets just guessed right occasionally with their prophets, see verse 6. They didn't believe that they would get all the prophecies right. Number four, people trust more in their own strength and abilities, verse 15. Number five, teachings are often not reasonable. And so that's why they refuse the words of the prophets. Verse 18. Number six, teachings of the prophets are confused traditions and cannot be proved. And so therefore they reject them. Verse 20. Number seven, prophets trick and deceive us rather than doing real miracles. Verse 21. I have yet to see that happen in my 64 years here upon this earth, that a prophet doing a trick just to deceive us. Chapter 16, verses 15, 18, and 20, depending on one's own strength and wisdom. Elder Dallin H. Oaks cautioned us against relying solely upon personal study and reasoning to determine spiritual truths. Quote, the Book of Mormon describes an attitude among a people who depended slowly, solely upon their own strength and upon their own wisdom, and upon what they could witness with their own eyes. Upon the basis of reason, these persons rejected the prophet's sayings. It is not reasonable that such a being as a Christ shall come. Applying that same attitude, a prominent professor dismissed the Book of Mormon with the assertion, you don't get books from angels. It's just that simple. 
Those who seek knowledge, gospel knowledge, only by study and reason are particularly susceptible to the self-sufficiency and self-importance that sometimes characterize academic pursuits. As the Apostle Paul observed in his day, knowledge puffed up. He cautioned the learned, Take heed, lest ye by any means this liberty, knowledge of yours, becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Brothers and sisters, if we only believe in what we see, then I guess if you've never been to Australia and never seen it, then it doesn't exist. That is just absurdity. So you can see the reasoning of the apostates and the reason of those who reject prophets is just absurd. Chapter 16, verse 14. The phrase, angels did appear unto wise men and declare unto them glad tidings of great joy. Isn't it interesting that this verse mentions that there were wise men and they were declaring glad tidings of great joy. Doesn't that sound like the angels, when they came to the shepherds in the field, saying, We bear tidings of great joy. Doesn't this sound like the birth of Christ? Perhaps it is these wise men in the new world who traveled to Jerusalem, guided by the new star, that see and worship the Savior when he is about two years old. This would account for the reason why it takes them two years to reach the King of Kings. Interesting, the Book of Mormon mentions wise men. And it takes them two years for the wise men to reach them. I submit to you that it's not only reasonable, but it's probably sh probable that these were the wise men who came to Christ. And that's why it took them so long. Chapter 16, verse 22, the phrase, Satan did go about spreading rumors and contentions. There is a quiet dignity about one who has been born of God, while on the other hand, there is an overwhelming urge among the impure to sow discord and kindle discontent. Why is it important to avoid contention with others? Elder Russell M. Nelson explained that the answer reaches back into pre-mortal life. Quote, to understand why the Lord has commanded us to contend to not us not to contend one with another, we must know the true source of contention. A Book of Mormon prophet revealed this important knowledge even before the birth of Christ. Contention existed before the earth was formed. When God's plan for creation and mortal life on the earth was first announced, sons and daughters of God shouted for joy. The plan was dependent on man's agency. This subsequent fall from the presence of God and the merciful provision of a Savior to redeem mankind. Scriptures reveal that Lucifer sought vigorously to amend the plan by destroying the agency of man. Satan's selfish efforts to alter the plan of God resulted in great contention in heaven. This war in heaven was not a war of bloodshed. It was a war of conflicting ideas, the beginning of contention. Scripture repeatedly warned that the father of contention opposes the plan of Heavenly Father. Satan's method relies on the infectious canker of contention. Satan's motive to gain personal acclaim even over God himself. End of quote. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you to gain some new insights about principles and doctrines found in the book of Helaman, verses 13 through 16. If this helped you, please hit the like button.